Hi, Jeremy here, Modern Vitality. In today's video, the top five power herbs for candida. I'm gonna be sharing with you my top five power herbs for candida. Now just know I've whittled it down. There's a ton of herbs that are very helpful. I've whittled it down to some things you may have in your cupboard at home right now, just waiting to be reincorporated into your life. Other things you may have to go to a grocery store to get. Okay, I'll explain some of that as we go. My caveat here is that there is no one super herb, silver bullet thing for most of these complex chronic inflammatory conditions including candida, because candida is usually not by itself. It's usually just one part of a larger picture, right? There's usually a lot more going on in the human body when the candida is a problem. So we have to think systematically. We got to think bigger. It's not just about grabbing one thing and just hoping that suppresses some symptoms or kills the bad guys or whatever we're just kind of like finger crossed wishing for. You're always going to do better if you take herbs or you take supplements or you take whatever intervention and you start to weave it into a comprehensive long-term treatment plan for yourself. So I'm going to show you how to do that after we talk about the herbs. All right, let's get started. All right, here we go. I'm going to share with you my top five power herbs. And these are things that I found helpful for folks that are recovering from all manner of complex chronic inflammatory conditions. And the reason why is because no matter what the disease is, our human body still has the same types of pathways. If we start to respect the landscape of our body and we use things like some of these herbs I'm going to share with you in the context of a larger healing plan, the body's smart. It wants to work itself out. It wants to thrive. We are built to thrive. That's how we're designed. That's our optimal setting. So these are some of the herbs that I found can help most people get there. But my caveat, the reason I'm bringing this up, my caveat is that these are not good for everyone. In fact, there are some people that these kinds of herbs, even though we're looking at things that are able to be purchased in a grocery store, right? You don't need a prescription for this stuff. It doesn't mean it's necessarily safe or good for every single person. So I'll go through the caveats at the end when we do our our five herbs. We'll talk about caveats so that you're not taking something that may mess you up. And of course, I'm not giving you medical advice. I'm just giving you information and we're all adults here, right? And then after that, I'll show you how to weave these into a comprehensive strategy so that you're not just relying on one thing to try to fix your whole body, right? It's way better to have a comprehensive strategy. So these herbs could be seen as medicinal spices, right? Spices that you have in your kitchen, I tried to pick the things that are most accessible here, things that you can find at most grocery stores. You can get them online. You may even have these in your cupboard right now. And our first one is ginger. Okay, this is a famous herb for a reason. I'm starting with one that you hopefully know about already. Ginger, in uh, Chinese medicine, we call it shengjiang, which means uh, raw ginger. There's different types of ginger we use, but this is pictured here as raw ginger. It has a lot of properties. Some of the key ones, anti-inflammatory, which this should be kind of obvious in terms of why that's helpful when you're dealing with a complex chronic inflammatory condition, right? Having something going in your body that's helping with the inflammation, it's having an immune effect, that's good. Diaphoretic. What does diaphoretic mean? It means it generates a sweat. Why is a sweat important? Well, especially for stage one, when we're working on the immune system, we want to see the body's ability to regulate its sweating process because sweat is like the windows of your house being able to open and close. You need to have that ability. If they're stuck open and you're sweating all the time, that's not good. If you can never break a sweat, that's not good. We need to have what's called appropriate sweating. And sweating is really important because it's one of the ways that our immune system works to clear out pathogens. Isn't that cool? So that's why ginger is one of these folk remedies. Very, very useful for if you feel like you're getting a cold, you know, coming down with something, a flu. A lot of people will take ginger tea or have ginger in a soup or even ginger in a foot soak, right? Did you know you could soak your feet with ginger tea? Very, very interesting, and it's a good way to get that, that sweat going. When we have complex chronic inflammatory conditions, basically, it's like you're coming down with a flu in slow motion. This could be a 10-year flu or a 20-year flu where you just feel those body aches. And ginger may be one of these herbs that's very helpful in that case. It has a warming property. Ginger's warming. And you're going to see a theme here with all five of these herbs is they're all on the warming side. And why that is is because in most cases... When we have a chronic illness, something that's gone on a long time, and I'm going to clarify this in the caveats towards the end, so you want to stick around for that. It's very important to get these distinctions. When you have a chronic illness that's been going on for a long time, often what's going on is we're running out the metabolism. Meaning, you might see this manifest as, oh, I've got a thyroid condition, or my adrenals are shot. Those are just manifestations. Those are just the tips of the branches. The reality is, deep down, in the roots is that we're running out of our vital energy, right? The metabolism is starting to get weaker because it takes so much energy to manage this condition, to manage the difficulties. 
So people's batteries start to run very, very low. And what often happens is people will start to get cold. Okay, cold hands and feet, very common. Cold body, can't warm up. Now there is another side to this where people can get warm and hot. And typically that's because of inflammation. So it's not even a real heat. It's just an inflammatory process or you're getting some kind of heat, just like how compost piles heat up when they're rotting. That can be happening inside with all the bacterial and other pathogen activity. It causes this false sense of heat. Most people who have been sick for a long time, deep down are cold inside. And that's why we have to use things that warm them, right? This is one of the um, just general, don't take this as a hundred percent fixed binary thing, but in general, we lean towards warming and rewarming because corpses are cold, right? Living things are warm. It's, it's that simple. Ginger also benefits digestion, which is great and wonderful and important because we need to be able to extract our food. We need to be able to get energy out of that if we want to heal. So this is one of those herbs that can help a lot because so many times we get the, the gut dysbiosis coming in, no matter what's going on with you. If you have a hidden pathogen, it opens the door for more and more of these pathogens. And then all of a sudden we've just got this raucous party going on in our guts. And ginger is one of those herbs that can be helpful to benefit your digestion and help to restore some of that healthy environment there so that you can be more hospitable to healthy bacteria in your gut. You want to cultivate a nice, capable, and harmonious microbiome. And ginger is a good way to do that. Our next one is garlic. All right, garlic. Hopefully you've heard of this one too, right? Garlic. In Chinese medicine, we call it da suan. It's warming, again, and also has anti-parasitic effects. Now, garlic is one of these herbs that's got a lot of folklore around it. You know, different cultures will hang it up on their doors, or we have myths about garlic and vampires, right? That's something I remember just being a little kid and just thinking this was the most random, <laughs> random weapon against vampires, right? Oh, the vampire's in my house. Okay, you know, uh, throw garlic at it. You know, where did this come from? Well, some of my thinking on this, when I started to explore folklore and uh, traditional human culture and herbology and some of the ancient wisdom traditions, I've noticed that garlic is used in a lot of cultures for anti-parasitic actions. And if you think about a vampire and what that symbolizes, we have this creature who is active at night, drinks your blood, right? These kinds of things. It's very much sharing a lot of traits with parasites. That, and if you look at the, the werewolf, it's a similar kind of story, like getting active on the full moon. Although I've got different ideas about, about werewolves and maybe where that comes from with medical uh, history, but this, that's for a different video. We'll talk about that another time. In terms of garlic though, looking at it as an anti-vampire herb, right? We can see those tiny vampires, those little parasites that live inside of us. They don't like garlic either. And a lot of times raw garlic is actually used. That can be kind of harsh for your digestion. So if you're not um, acclimated to raw garlic, you might want to start small with that or work your way up. But people will eat little bits of raw garlic and get it down into their stomach and it goes through the intestines and just goes along the whole way and can be very irritating to any kind of parasites that are in there. It's also antiviral, showing antiviral properties, showing antifungal properties, right? We're seeing a theme here, getting these vampires and parasites and things out of your body. It's helping with that antibacterial. Also, now we have on the other side, cardioprotective, right? So what happens a lot of times with complex chronic inflammatory conditions is that we don't have a ton of energy and then we don't exercise. And of course, the lack of exercise is not good for our heart. We can get problems with our blood pressure. We can get pro all kinds of problems with that. So you want to have these different ways to come in and try to offset some of the damage, right? And I've spoken before about fatigue. A lot of times fatigue is actually there to protect you. You shouldn't be exercising, but that doesn't mean that our cardiovascular system has to just suffer, okay? Especially when there are other solutions like garlic. Garlic's also good for food stagnation. Now what's food stagnation? Well, food stagnation can be seen as gut dysbiosis, where you have a lot of bacteria that don't really belong in your digestive tract that are just hanging out and partying. And the traditional thing with Eastern medicine with food stagnation is that basically you're not getting that peristalsis. You're not getting your food and peristalsis means the way that your whole digestive tract kind of waves and pumps to move food down. So if you're not getting that process, then what oftentimes happens is you'll feel like you ate something and it's just sitting there. It's in your, you can feel it like in your stomach or you can feel it kind of in your abdomen and it just feels like a brick. Now you may have overeaten, that happens, 
When we eat too much, it challenges the digestion and that can cause food stagnation, or we can just have some deficiency in the tone. There's different reasons why our, our body's not providing that peristalsis, but garlic is one of these herbs that shows some promise for helping move that along. So if you're having sluggish digestion, if you're eating food and it just kind of sits there in a heap in your body and you can just feel it like, like a brick, you might think about incorporating some more garlic into your diet. Cinnamon. Oh boy. Number three. So here's another herb that I hope you've heard of. And I'm going to take this from a few different angles. There's actually three different types of cinnamon we're going to look at. So I hope you've got your uh, notebook ready, right? Pen and paper and be taking notes because there's a lot to learn with these distinctions. So cinnamon comes in three different types that we're going to talk about and we'll go through them. Uh, we're doing the medicinal ones first, and then we'll do the culinary at the end. So the first type of cinnamon that we'll explore is called guajir in Chinese medicine. And this is the twig, cinnamon twig. Now, cinnamon comes on a tree, okay? The best trees usually grow in Vietnam or thereabouts. That's what most people agree on. And cinnamon itself, if you get really, really, really high quality cinnamon, medicinal grade cinnamon, that can be one of the most expensive herbs per pound. So just know that while this is a common spice that you can get in your Starbucks uh, latte, you know, during autumn with like pumpkin spice and all that, there are actually different grades of cinnamon that are extremely potent and carry a, a premium price tag too. This is a, a high level herb. So when we look at this one, this is the cinnamon twig, and this comes from the tips, the twigs, right? The tips of the tree branches, the very outer tips. And you can see this cross section of it's basically just the tip of the twig that's been cut and you can see the inner woody part of the twig as well as the bark on the outside. And it's, uh, they're very small. You know, these, these herbs are usually about the size of a penny or a dime. You know, they're not really that, that big because they're the small tips of the twigs. And this is a warming herb, right? Of course, it has a diaphoretic property, which we already talked about with ginger, but it helps you with the sweating. Now, the thing about cinnamon twig that's diaphoretic means it helps you with your sweating it's really interesting because this is the part of the tree that is in the expansive part, right? The tree is growing at the tips of the branches. And we'll come back to this with our next type of cinnamon, and I'll give you the contrast here. But this is the part that's that's growing upward and outward and expanding out of the tree. And it has the same type of effect with our circulatory system. It helps us increase our capillary pressure so that we're having an upward and outward pressure by the surface of our skin. Isn't that interesting? That helps to push out sweat, right? It helps with the pressure differential at the surface of our body, and it may help to prevent pathogens from coming in via the skin. Super cool. If you think about a balloon being blown up, that's the, the upward and outward effect of guajir, the cinnamon twig, is having that same type of push, upward and outward push. It's expansive, like a balloon being blown up. And I really like this because when we deal with complex chronic inflammatory conditions, a lot of times, you know, if it's been so long that you've been dealing with these things and it's sapping your energy, a lot of times we actually start to become more deflated. You know, you, you feel it in your personality, you feel it in your body. We can see it in the eyes. I've done other videos about this, how you can look at these outward signs. And also, I mean, you just know, you just know, you go, man, I'm, I'm feeling like hollow and kind of deflated. This type of herb, because of where it grows on the tree, the part of the tree, it has a certain energy and it's the opposite of that, right? It's inflating. It's very, very cool. We also have blood sugar regulation with cinnamon. And one of the things that you want to know about blood sugar regulation is that yes, people with diabetic issues may benefit from incorporating more cinnamon into their diet. Of course, that would be great. If we're eating a Western diet or even, you know, some of these healthier versions of, you know, clean eating and all that, we still may be eating things that can spike our blood sugar. Even if you're only eating fruits, you're still getting sugars from those fruits. So having some cinnamon, for example, if you're gonna eat a pear, but you put a little cinnamon on it, right? Culinary, we'll, we'll get to culinary cinnamon in just a minute, but even culinary cinnamon is gonna have this same type of property where you can just put some on there and it'll help you absorb that without the blood sugar spike. Fascinating when we start to work that way with our, our diet, trying to eat our food medicinally and more balanced. Right, so we have issues with blood sugar that can manifest as diabetes. We also have issues with blood sugar that can manifest as menstrual issues, like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. A lot of times, women that have that are struggling, and they also have some kind of problem with insulin going on. And cinnamon, right, is used traditionally in the types of formulas. None of these herbs are usually used alone in Eastern medicine. It's always bundled into a context because you're going to have other herbs that are working together and balancing and all that. It's a, it's a skill, right? It's a very highly refined science of combining these things 
the right way for the right people. But when we look at a lot of these traditional formulas for PCOS, you can see there's cinnamon in there. And there's a lot to be said for the, the help with the blood sugar and how that communicates back to hormones. It's very interesting. And the third thing I'll tell you about blood sugar is that when you have, and this is probably the most important thing for any kind of complex chronic inflammatory condition, when you have fungus, yeast, uh, bacteria that are rogue and getting wild, they want to eat your blood sugar. Okay, that's what feeds them. So anything we can do to keep the blood sugar more stable and more regulated will actually help to starve those pathogens. This is massive. We have also digestive support. Cinnamon can be useful for helping to warm because it's warming. It can help to warm some of our digestion, which is um, you know kind of a vague way to say this. But when you have people who come with even like gastroparesis, which basically just means the stomach is paralyzed, this happens. It's not fun. This is one of those things where I, I talked, when we talked about garlic, I talked about how the peristalsis has to happen, the movement of the food through the digestive tract. You can use cinnamon, especially guajir, within the context of a formula with other herbs. And those actions of the warming will help to actually move the stomach a little bit and start to get, get this process underway for people. Very important. We also have some pain relief with cinnamon. And we also have use for menstrual issues. Like I mentioned, PCOS is one of them and anxiety. Now the anxiety, I really want to talk about this because the anxiety piece is historically documented for thousands and thousands of years of people using uh, guajir, the cinnamon twig, or our next type of cinnamon, I'll, I'll explain to you in just a moment, to help with anxiety and panic attacks. And there's this old term in Eastern medicine called running piglet chi, right? And what does that mean? Running piglet chi. Well, you can translate the chi as kind of like the energetics of it, right? But the idea is that it feels like a little piglet, a baby piglet is running from your abdomen all the way straight up your midline, up your throat. And you get this feeling of like pulsing and pounding that's going upwards. It's usually accompanied by, right, uh, anxiety and panic. It doesn't feel good. So you can see this um, pattern playing out all the way back in the old days. And we have anxiety now in our culture, but it's always been there. It's part of the human condition. And guajir is one of the herbs within certain formulas that can be very effective for actually helping people not have that happen so much. So when I look at things like um, even POTS too with the, the blood pressure, right? P-O-T-S, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, right? When you have that happen, your blood pressure is dropping. That's kind of the opposite. It's, it's not going up like a piglet, it's going down and dropping. And guajir is one of the herbs that helps to regulate that as well. Very, very cool. We also have history of use for chronic UTI and yeast infections. And we can see that because we know that cinnamon also has antipathogenic, I didn't put it here, there's so many benefits to these herbs, it has antipathogenic activities. And we know this because of thieves oil, right? If you ever looked at thieves oil where it's a blend, usually essential oils will have it. And the idea there was during the plague, if you wanted to burglarize a plague house, right? People were dying of the plague. And then there would be these burglars, these criminals who wanted to come in and steal their silver or whatever, but they didn't want to get the plague themselves. They would douse themselves in these oils, which helped to prevent the plague from making them sick. One of those oils was cinnamon. So having the use for chronic UTIs, chronic yeast infections, we can see the immune systems getting some benefit here. And there's also some antipathogenic activity. I would also be willing to bet that the blood sugar regulation helps to starve out the yeast infections and helps to starve out whatever's infecting the bladder. All right, our next one is cinnamon is rogue right? And this is the bark of the tree itself, the trunk of the tree. So the guajir was the tips, of the branches, and then the rogue is the bark. Now, again, we have a warming nature, right? This is really good for people who feel cold. So the tips of the branches are the outward part of the tree that's growing. The trunk, the bark of the trunk is more like this core kind of thing. It's deeper. So we're not looking at the surface of the body. We're looking at something more internal. This is where this herb kind of resonates for people. So when you have complex chronic inflammatory conditions and you're running down your internal battery and you start to feel cold all the time, this is one of those herbs that has more strength in that department than the uh, guajir, like the, the twig tips would. Sleep trouble is another one because a lot of times people will feel cold and have trouble falling asleep. And this is a sign, how we start to look at this is a little more energetic. You gotta start to understand your body in terms of processes. But if you can see that there's a cycle in your life, meaning every morning you wake up and the yang, right? The energy, the power 
of your body starts to wake up and comes up and out. And then you experience the day. And then that yang, like all your metabolic activity starts to go in and down in the evening, which helps you then get tired and fall asleep. You can see that kind of cycle, right? When that happens, that's healthy and normal. But a lot of times if people are feeling cold, it's because that yang isn't consolidating back. It's almost like there's not enough. You start to run out of juice and then you don't have enough energy to go back into your core. So we get stuck with these things where we have trouble falling asleep plus for cold. Great case for this type of herb. Of course, within the context of a, a larger formula that makes uh, use of kind of where somebody's at with their whole situation. Chronic unhealing wounds. I really like this because when we look at immune activity, we have not only scouring pathogens and all that, but we also have healing and repair. People don't always know this, but the macrophages, those Pac-Men, right? The, the Pac-Man idea of like what's going around in your immune system and just eating the bacteria. Like you were taught, if I was, you know, if you were taught the same way I was in, in school when we were kids, they always showed us these Pac-Man drawings going around eating the germs, right? It's that kind of idea. But those Pac-Men also are responsible for tissue repair and healing. They're also like the road crew, the cleanup crew. And so when we stimulate our immune system, when we help it along, we can actually create healing and get rid of some of these unhealing wounds. Where else we see this is with diabetes and you get these uh, lesions and blisters and things that, that just don't go away. There's also uh, water blisters. They're called chronic water blisters. And traditionally, uh, Rogue was used for that within the context, of course, of a, a larger formula. But it's one of these kind of powerhouse herbs that starts to get the, the fire going to where the immune system can now get to work and do what it needs to do. We also have a history of use with menstrual health, similar to the, the twigs, the great guajer, the cinnamon twig. And we also have chronic UTI and yeast infections there as well. So there's something kind of consistent and powerful about the cinnamon. No matter which part of the tree you get it off of, it's going to have some of these antipathogenic effects. It's going to have some blood sugar regulation. And that's why it can be useful for PCOS, like menstrual health, antifungal, right? Chronic unhealing wounds, chronic UTI, yeast infection, all these stubborn things. So now we'll look at cinnamon, culinary cinnamon, which is more what you're used to. You know, the other two you need to get from specialty herb shops or something like that. Um, sometimes Asian grocery stores will have them. But for the most part, you know, if you go to a regular grocery store in the U.S. or in the Western, you know, hemisphere uh, of the world, then you're going to have like cinnamon, grocery cinnamon, or culinary cinnamon. And even if you're only having culinary cinnamon, still good. It's not as strong or specialized as the twigs or the bark of the um, trunk. Usually culinary cinnamon is more from the, the branches, not the twigs of the branches, but just kind of the branch bodies themselves. And that's okay. We're still going to have some antibacterial properties. We're still going to have some blood sugar regulation and we're still going to have digestive aid and it's still delicious. All right. Our next one is clove. Look at these. So clove in Eastern medicine, we call it ding xiang. And again, it's a warming spice, right? One of the reasons I'm bringing up clove, especially with complex chronic health conditions is that clove has an effect of breaking down biofilms. Now biofilms are basically like the slime it can be slimy all the way to basically like concrete consistency of the protective layers that a lot of times bacteria and other organisms will live in there too. But they basically secrete this so that they just have a, a protective slime layer that can be very, very hard as well, difficult to penetrate. So when we take herbs and we take supplements and we take pharmaceuticals and whatever we're doing, if we're trying to kill some of these things that have gotten out of hand in our body, if we're trying to clean out a lot of times those biofilms will actually protect the pathogens. So when you have something like clove, and there are other herbs too that we use, there's a ton of these in Eastern medicine that break down biofilms, what that does is that starts to shatter the security system so that even though these germs, these pathogens that are in your body and don't belong there, even though they're trying to defend themselves with the slime, the clove helps to come in and penetrate that so that your other like killing agents, basically your other antimicrobial stuff has an easier time getting through. Very, very cool. We also have clove as a powerhouse, right? We also have antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral properties. It also can help with libido. So here's one, especially for men, especially for men, but I wouldn't be surprised if women found this helpful too. It's not a sex tonic, right? It's not one of these things where it's like a horny goat weed or something. But what we could do is start to look at how chronic illness degrades the libido over time. Typically that happens. And if that's the case, again, it's because of that, that yang, that vital force is waning. And we just don't have extra energy in our energetic budget 
for sex. And clove may be one of these herbs that can help to restore some of that. So traditionally it's used for for men, but I would say women could even try it too. And of course, if you're using it within the context of a, a larger healing plan, you're going to have other factors coming in, which is good. Everything can all be working together. We also have blood sugar regulation. We know why that's important already. And clove, I, I have to put this in here, toothache. Okay. Really good for toothache. A lot of times people will use clove. If you ever wonder why um, they use clove mouthwash and clove breath sprays and clove, uh, it can be in gum. It can be even those clove cigarettes, right? The idea is to get the clove in your mouth because clove in the mouth helps with gum health. It can help change the bacterial balance within the mouth so that you have a happier oral microbiome, which is good. It can be helpful for toothache because clove has kind of a numbing pain relieving property. So one of the things I say, and I know a lot of people with complex chronic health conditions have a history of root canals, a lot of dental work, just a lot of kind of problems in the complicated mouth, right? And I've got my own guesses why that is. I've got my own theories. I'm not going to get into all that in this video because we're going on pretty deep as it is. But what I recommend is to use clove, right? Use it in toothpaste, use clove oil, uh, make things that have clove in them. For example, pho, like a Vietnamese soup, P-H-O, it's called pho. You can start to make those broths. And that'll have a lot of these warming spices in there. And what you can do is you can be eating that, drinking that, and especially if you have to get a dental procedure done, right? If you have to get a root canal or you have to get a filling or whatever it is, your mouth's hanging open for a long time. They're spraying cold water in your mouth. You're getting cold, cold, cold in there. And then when you get home, it's sore, it's painful. Get some cloves into your diet, right? Whether you're rubbing the oil on your gums or you're, you're drinking a pho, a P-H-O, a pho broth or something, some way to get that clove in there because that can help a lot with rewarming the mouth and recovering from a dental procedure. Really, really important because you don't want those things to, to go on. You don't want to have sore, painful mouth for a long time on top of everything else. All right, number five, Sichuan peppercorn. Woo! So these you may have heard of. You may know these. Um, they're not spicy, right? In terms of, it's not like a jalapeno. It's not like a habanero. It's not that kind of spice. When we talk about the spice of Sichuan peppercorns, it's a different kind of spice. It's softer. It's like a sweet numb kind of flavor. It's not spicy. Like it's not going to light you up and uh, make you reaching for glasses of water and all that kind of stuff. So you may be familiar with the Sichuan peppercorn or this may be new for you. I saved it for our last one because this one's a little more exotic. It's a little harder to find and it's powerful in different ways. So the Sichuan peppercorn, we call them hua jiao in Eastern medicine. It's warming. It's really, really good for pain relief. Like I mentioned, it has a flavor that's kind of numbing almost. There's a sensation you get, right? They call it uh, mala. When you're, you're eating these, you'll get this little bit of happy, numb feeling in your mouth, okay? And it's kind of interesting because that's going to be happening throughout the rest of your body too. And you can, you can use these for all kinds of things. So if you have a uh, complex chronic health condition and there's pain, chronic pains, you can be eating hua jiao or Sichuan peppercorn within your food, which is good. Usually you'd want to get them and um, grind them up in a pepper grinder because those, they come like that. They're the peppercorns and, you know, you can make them, you can eat them like that, how they are, but they're a little unpleasant because it's kind of crunchy to eat. And for example, like my kids are always uh, picking them off. If I, if I cook something like a stir fry and I have some of these uh, peppercorns in there, my kids, if they get it on their spoon, they're always like, oh, why didn't you crush up the peppercorns? Well, you know, sometimes you can, whatever, you do it how you want, but you can grind them up with a pepper grinder. That's probably the best way make them into a powder. Uh, then you're eating it and then you're getting the the pain relief happening within your body systematically, which is great. Sometimes people use these externally too. Like they'll just put them in a, um, in a wrap. Like you can wrap them in cloth and you can heat them up and you can actually use that to uh, pound, right? <laughs> use that as percussion and kind of like smash that as a massage, smash it into your sore joints or your muscles or whatever else, or, you know, even better have somebody else do that for you. So people use these because they have such volatile oils. You can use them externally too, right? Really cool. They have an anti-inflammatory property. We're seeing some common themes here with these herbs for complex chronic inflammatory conditions, right? They have antiviral properties, antifungal properties, and they stimulate your appetite because they're delicious. There's really a, a very unique flavor with these. We spent a bit of time in Chengdu in China, uh, which is in the Sichuan province. And I'll tell you the food there, incredible, incredible. Incredible. So dynamic, so flavorful, so delicious. And they're using a lot of these herbs. You know, they're using garlic, they're using ginger. 
of course, right? But they're using also these Sichuan peppercorns in a lot of the dishes, and they have a very unique aromatic kind of sweetness to them. There's really nothing that tastes like that out there. Very, very unique. And if you're a person who likes to cook or who likes to explore new foods, this is something I'd really recommend you get into because once you start cooking with these, your your palate has now expanded. And why, why stimulate the appetite, right? Why is this good? A lot of people I meet say, oh, Jeremy, I'm having a hard time losing weight as it is. My metabolism is slowing down, right? Well, there's kind of two ways people tend to go with complex chronic inflammatory conditions. Some people have a hard time losing weight. Some people have a hard time gaining weight, right? There's actually two sides to it. It's not that everybody has a hard time losing weight, not at all. I've, I've seen both, I've worked with both plenty and you can get people to, to regulate, right? That's the idea. That's entirely the idea. When we have a low appetite though, as a result of like all the, basically all the beat down that we take from being ill for so long, that's not good. When people are trying to lose weight, you've got to still have an appetite. You've got to get that metabolic fire going because eating and having that digestive drive is part of the cycle of being able to have vitality, which means then losing the weight. And same thing for people that have trouble gaining weight, they need to have that healthy appetite, stimulate the appetite. And these are one of the herbs that you can use for that. Even smelling them will do it if you don't like to eat them. But of course, I would recommend if you're going to get into this, then uh, go for it. Now, these are one of the herbs that you might not be able to find at like a Western type grocery store, but you can usually find them at Asian markets, Asian grocery stores, and you can also find them online at various places. There are different levels of quality, which I'll talk about in just a moment. All right, here are the caveats. So we did we did my favorite five. Okay, there's plenty more herbs and spices like this that are very powerful. I picked my favorite five uh, within the context of complex chronic inflammatory conditions. Okay, things that I've seen that work for a lot of folks pretty well to incorporate. But I do have some caveats, and this is very important. You understand this. The, you got to understand the caveats, and you've got to understand how to phase these things. Okay, these that's it's one thing to just give somebody uh, a bunch of colors and say, okay, here's your blue, here's your red, here's your yellow. Right? But it's another thing to actually teach somebody how to paint and how to use them so that you don't just make a mess of the canvas. And this is the same thing with interventions. Everybody's looking for a silver bullet. Oh, I want this, the supplement that's going to save the day. You know, oh, we're looking to find, to isolate the one variable and reduce your illness down to this one virus or this one little micro molecule in your body. No, we have to understand a whole system right? Which means context. So my caveats here, if you want to get the most out of what you've spent your time learning here is one, are these panaceas? No. Okay. They're not panaceas by themselves. They are very, very helpful tools. And I'll go on to talk about that in just a moment. One of the things that we need to know is that not everybody will benefit because I've given you a list of warming spices. So if someone has for example, uh, in Eastern medicine, we look at the tongue a lot, right? If, if we stick our tongue out and it's like bright red, these might not be appropriate for that person at that time. However, if that person can do things to get some of the heat down, some of the inflammation down in their body, then they may come to graduate to where they can start to enjoy these types of herbs and spices again, and it would be beneficial for them. Okay, people move through cycles. Just because something's not good for you right now doesn't mean it never will be. We have to have parameters around that so we can understand as we grow, right, as we heal, that we can start treating ourselves differently because we've become different. We're evolving through stages. So currently, right, if you look at your tongue, and of course, I'm not giving you medical advice, but I'm just in general, if you look at your tongue and it's bright red, or you look at your tongue and there's a big, thick yellow coat or dark coat on there, then usually these wouldn't be the first herbs I would pick or recommend. Okay, most people, most people, can handle these in some amount anyway, regardless, because it's mixed into your food and we're doing all kinds of things throughout the day. But if you want to be very strict about it and you want to really be precise, then if you're somebody who has a bright red tongue or has a big, thick yellow coat, then this wouldn't be the right time to incorporate a lot of warming herbs and spices. You don't want to add to more heat, even if it is false heat, right? Also, quality matters on all these. So I talked about three different types of cinnamon right? And some of those are like the most expensive thing coming off the boat. There's all different quality levels. Same thing with the Sichuan peppercorns. You want all different quality levels. You want to make sure you're getting a very high quality one so that you're getting a very strong, potent spice, right? If you want this thing to be food that is medicinal, then you want to get medicinal quality spices, okay? So be savvy with that. And then you also need to know that like ginger, for example, you go to the store, ginger, hey, it's cheap. 
Well, you might want to go with organic ginger because non-organic ginger is a lot bigger. How'd they get it bigger, right? <laughs> First of all, that's the one question, right? We just start thinking like that. But what I've found is that oftentimes if ginger is not organic, that means it's been irradiated. So we want to try to get things that haven't been irradiated, right? You want to start to look into all these qualities. If you can get your ginger organic, that would be great. Same thing with garlic. There's all kinds of garlic. Why not get organic garlic? Why not go to your local farmer's market and support a farmer who's growing some kind of heirloom strain of garlic, right? Something with a lot of color. Sometimes these garlics are like purple looking almost. You want to you wanna explore this stuff and try to find the freshest, highest quality you can. And I know I talked about cinnamon. Cloves are usually pretty straightforward. Um, and we talked about the peppercorns, right? All those things have uh, quality gradients where you want, like the peppercorns, you want to be able to do your research. And if you try some and they don't have right? Here's a real easy test. If they don't have that flavor, that mala, where you're like, wow, my, my lips are just buzzing. My tongue is buzzing. It almost feels numb. If this is delicious, right? If that's not happening, then I wouldn't expect that these things are going to have that strong of a medicinal effect either. Okay. I know that's pretty straightforward. And my last caveat here, all these herbs, spices, and inclusive of every other strategy there, it's best when used in the right context. Okay, you want to have an overarching strategy and a plan and a structure for how to reclaim your health, not just grasping at random stuff, right? With the right context, these herbs are phenomenal, especially when used at the right time on a healing process. And what do I mean by right time? Well, the first thing, okay, that we always look at is the immune system. And the reason why is because well, I'm going to tell you the body has basically an order that it likes to be interacted with. Nobody's talking about this. It comes from very, very old Eastern medicine. It's not even what I learned in acupuncture school when I graduated back in 2009. They weren't talking about this stuff. However, it's way older than that. It's just, you got to find the lineages and you got to find the people, which I did, who understand this stuff. The body has an order. There are so many therapies that seem like a good idea for your condition. However, if you just throw everything at it, you're doing the shotgun approach. It's a mess. It's not scientific, right? You can't tell what's doing what. You wind up taking a bunch of stuff. It is not an easy process. But the best thing to do is to start organizing all of your strategies and go, okay, this is more of an immune strategy. This is more of a digestive strategy, right? All these over here, these are more for stress relief, neuroadrenal. These over here, this is more blood circulation. These over here, this is more boosting and, and supplementing deficiencies. This is more hormonal. You can start to make buckets, okay? And then you line your buckets up. And we're going to talk about the first four today because that's where most people get the most benefits. In fact, most people go through the first three and they get the most benefits. So stage one, immune system. Anything you have that's working on your immune system goes in that bucket, that's where we start. You wanna have a very clear strategy here and you wanna be able to do things in an order that makes sense. So start with your immune system because that's gonna help get rid of a lot of the big problems, including hidden pathogens, including non-specific immune function where you're just like smoldering and inflamed. It's gonna help with biofilm breakdown. It's gonna help with lymphatic flow. You're basically getting these things out of your body that don't belong there so that you can start to heal. You want to get the inflammation down. Okay, this is really important. Next is digestion, right? Digestive system. So some things are aimed more at digestion, which you want to have a healthy digestive system, okay? Because that way you can start to not only digest your food better and get more energy out of that and more nutrition, but also your digestion and your immune system are intimately connected. Your digestion is where most of your immune system lives anyway. This is really cool. We're finding this out now through modern science, but it's you know validating things that we've known in Eastern medicine for 3,000, 5,000, something thousand years, okay? Very important. We also have gut dysbiosis, which means the balance of the little creatures that live in your intestines needs to be restored. So there can be some things that are growing and getting out of hand. There can be some things that should be there that aren't due to a variety of factors, including what we eat, but also what we're exposed to, all the toxins, chemicals, pesticides, all this stuff, mycotoxins, right? There's a lot of things going on. Other meds, antibiotic use. There's a lot of stuff we can attribute to this imbalance in the guts. So you want to start to restore that. That's the next step. Stage three, neuroadrenal stress time. Okay. This is where we get going with the way our, our mind is working, the way our nervous system is working, the way we handle stress. If we feel neurologically overwhelmed, if we feel like we're, we have a very close trigger, right? When something little thing happens and it's like, boom, it just, oh, we get so, you know, stressed out. We want to start to increase that threshold. This is where a lot of different therapies can be useful. 
there are herbs, there are supplements, there's breath work, like breathing practices, there's all kinds of stuff. And this is where those live. One of the mistakes I see happen a lot of times is people try to start there. We go, oh, it's mind over matter. You know, I healed my mind. But really, it becomes very difficult. For example, like if you've got a, a bunch of parasites and heavy metals in your body, it becomes very difficult to will that stuff out. Whereas you could just go after your immune system first and get that cleaned up. And now you have a, a stronger base to stand on when you start to work on your own personal growth and spiritual practices and the way you show up in the world and the way you handle and metabolize stress. Okay, you set yourself up for success if you do things in the right order. This is also when we tend to get the sleep cycle dialed in better, right? Get that circadian rhythm going. It's lovely. Okay, we get back in touch with nature and how we evolved. The fourth one, blood circulation. This is where we start to move blood. This is where we start to really feed the cells and the tissue so they can grow, right? They can repair. This is where exercise tends to come in. This is one of the kind of mistakes I see people make too, is they try to start here. They start at stage four, blood circulation, by starting some kind of exercise regimen when they have a complex chronic inflammatory condition and fatigue and exhaustion, and there's no energy to be had. And we think, oh, I better push through, right? I better push through it because you know, exercise is good for me and maybe I just need to, to just break through. And what happens instead, because there's still inflammation that's just rampant in the immune system, most likely due to hidden pathogens, or some other thing setting off the immune system, okay? What you do when you exercise is you're just recirculating all that inflamed blood, and then you get PEMS, post-exertional malaise syndrome, where you're knocked out for like a week, just suffering, like with this hangover from exercise. This is what happens with skipping steps. But if we do it right, if we get that stuff cleared out in the first place, by the time you get to stage four, all of a sudden taking a walk or doing exercise or playing pickleball or whatever you're into, right? Kayaking, whatever it is, now is not going to be such a threat to your body because you're not circulating around a bunch of inflamed blood. This is really important to have this distinction. I see, I've seen so many people who get so burned out because they try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, but you're trying things in the wrong order, which is why it's failing. There's nothing wrong with you specifically. There's no reason you can't exercise. You just can't exercise yet. It's not time yet. We have to get the rest of your system ready. Okay, so those are stages one through four. So whatever you're doing, whatever therapies you're using, you want to start to examine that and you want to start to understand what system am I working on now? What system am I emphasizing with this? And can I make sure that before I'm working on, you know, exercising or working on my stress relief or whatever it is that I've started with stage one with my immune system? Can I make sure that? Okay, it's really, really important. When you go in the right order, just like a combination lock, when you go in the right order, then it opens, right? It opens up, it expands, your world gets bigger. If you go in the wrong order, you, you're just gonna be, you know, trying to bang your head against the wall while you're trying to bust into a, a locked door. It's a whole different deal. Most people think that unlocking healing is like finding the right key for the lock. And that's a misconception because it's not a key lock, it's a combination lock. All right, looking for a key means grabbing for a silver bullet and just hoping and praying that the latest supplement or whatever is gonna just solve everything. There is no key, it's a combination. And the combination has to be the right stuff in the right order, okay? Those are the two caveats. This is just how it works. This is what I found. This is like the best way possible that I know to get somebody from feeling sick, shrinking world, not really happy about life, not much of a future, right? Frustrated, overwhelmed, exhausted, burned out, to working through the stages and then going, hey, I've been back to life again. I'm having sex again. I'm doing things. I'm showing up for my family. I'm throwing a party <laughs> for my grandson or whatever. I'm traveling for a wedding. I'm in Europe walking along on cobblestone streets and I'm not getting tired. I'm in New Zealand hiking mountains and going down beaches when I used to have fibromyalgia and be afraid to leave a two mile radius of my house because I was gonna be exhausted. Right? These are how you get those changes. It doesn't just happen magically. You've got to have the right combination, which anybody can learn. That's part of my job, as I see it. If you're struggling with a complex chronic health condition, you might consider not struggling alone. I've built an amazing community. We've got our own chat group. We're off of the big tech things. It's just our own private chat where you can come in and you can meet other people who are lovely and positive and vibrant and supportive. Really fantastic people from all over the world that are on various stages of their healing journey. They're working the stages, right? Immune, digestive, neuroadrenal, blood circulation. They're in their process. I'm in there every day. It's free to join. 
you can come on in, you can ask me anything, you can meet some other people, you can be inspired, you can ask them things. What's working for you? You know, here's where I am. Introduce yourself. Even if you're shy, even if you're an introvert, it's a fantastic community. There's plenty, you're gonna be in good company with introverts there. There's plenty of introverts, right? We're very respectful, we're very kind. We're, we're careful with each other's energy, right? We have very good boundaries in there. So we have a group, chat group. There's also a vault where I've got interactive videos where you can start to really get yourself a plan so you can know what you're doing, what's your next practical step towards getting your life back. And again, you can ask me anything in there, it's fantastic. That's where I'm answering questions. I'm not in the comments section of YouTube, I'm having deep, conversations and actual connection in my own group. So I'd encourage you, right? If you'd like to join that, there's an application. You're a detective, you'll find it. It's near this video somewhere. And you can get your application sent in. And when I take a look, if you look like a good fit for our group, for what we're doing, I'll let you know. And I keep the group pretty cozy. We keep it like to one to 200 people is about the max. That way I know who's in there. And when I answer your question, it's very specific and I know who I'm talking to, okay? But what happens with that is that it's capped. So it does fill up. So if I see your application come in and it looks like a good fit, it might be a month, might be two months before you get in. I'll try to get you in on the next monthly cohort. I'll do my best because I know that you're excited and you want to get in there. So I try not to make people wait, but just know if it does take a little while, that's why. So that's our group. I would encourage you to join. In the meantime, you might consider subscribing to this channel. That way you can get more health information like this video that helps you instead of just kind of mindlessly scrolling, which we all fall into sometimes, but you could actually train YouTube to show you videos that help you get your life back, right? Isn't that cool? Okay, so let's get you feeling better. Cheers.